He is a lecturer at the University of Toronto and has also worked in international air evacuation um, and expedition medicine in, on Arctic and Antarctic ships. Um, his first book, Bloodletting and Miraculous Cures, which I read with great interest and fascination when it first came out, um, and I continue to go back to, particularly in times of medical emergency, as the era that we're living on in right now. It hit the Canadian literary scene, like um, winning the 2006 Scotiabank Giller Prize before making its way to screen as an HBO Canada television series. Um, he followed up this debut book with a non-fiction work, The Flu Pandemic and You, um, and a, a guide to the um, influenza pandemics, which I think is increasingly relevant today, and a, non um, and a biography of Tommy Douglas. His first novel, The Headmaster's Wager, which I believe he's going to read from today, is about um, a Chinese gambler, the headmaster of an English school in Saigon around the, Vietnam, around the time of the Vietnam War, and it kind of touches close to home because that's kind of um, where our histories kind of intersect for me. Um, so it's the era of the 1960s to mid-70s. Um, he began this work initially as kind of his first project, put it aside so that he could learn, I guess, um, hone the skills of writing, and that's when he began his short, his short, his collection of short stories, and then he proceeded on to his um, novel. Um, this novel was a finalist for the 2012 Governor General's Award, was long listed for the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction, long listed for the Impact Dublin Prize, and short listed for the Commonwealth Book Prize. In short, He's a quite a distinguished author. We're very, very lucky to have him today. Um, please well, join me in welcoming Dr. Vincent Lamb. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that uh, exceedingly kind introduction. And thank you to, um, to all the folks who helped make this possible. Uh, especially Josh and Phil. Phil's around here somewhere. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here in London. Uh, it is actually the town of my birth. Um, my father was studying, and I just realized this a few moments ago, probably in this building, because he was here doing his MBA at the time. And uh, so, you know, who knows? He may have even received lectures in this hall at that time. Um, and, uh, and our family moved elsewhere when I was quite small, but, uh, but nonetheless, you know, nostalgic stories are told about London, Ontario. And the basis for this book in terms of its life within my life is also in what one might call nostalgic stories. Um, I, I sort of use the air quotes because they're really nostalgic stories tinged with uh, also flavors of bitterness, regret, loss, what could have been. And when I was growing up in Ottawa, for the most part, I was told stories about my family in Vietnam. And, you know, these stories had various components to them. Um, and one of the interesting things for me growing up in the... Um, you know, say late 70s, early 80s, by the time, you know, I was of an age where I could begin to understand the world around me, was that I was growing up very much in a Cold War, post-Vietnam conflict era. And, of course, the conflict in Vietnam, you know, had, as far as North America was concerned, uh, closed in 1975, although there were ongoing conflicts and issues in the region, but from the North American cultural perspective, that was really a closed chapter in 1975. Um, and at the same time, the Cold War was ongoing. So there was this kind of narrative around um, the battle with communism um, and also a lost conflict from the North American perspective in Vietnam. And a conflict which I think many people in North America viewed with a certain degree of, of regret, and I think it's fair to say shame as well. So, so that was very interesting for me because I grew up within this sort of context and within this sort of discussion, but I grew up hearing stories about my parents' childhoods in Vietnam during the time of that conflict. 
And those stories, you know, sometimes had some <coughs> element of the roar, which would, which would sort of enter into the narrative. But often they didn't. And even when they did, it would be very peripheral. Um, there, there weren't really, in, in the case of my family, um, pivotal events where, where everything centered as a turning point upon some sort of occurrence in the war. And yet, in many of the stories, you know, one was aware of the dynamics and the forces of conflict which would sort of push at people's lives. And one of the central stories that I was often told about was I was told about the story of my grandfather. And, uh, and my grandfather was an interesting guy. And I guess it has to be interesting if you want your children and later your grandchildren to tell stories about you. Because if, if you're sort of you know, uh, dull and, uh, and completely predictable, then no one will have any stories. But my grandfather was quite the opposite. On, on one hand, he was quite a successful business person. He was the proprietor of an English school in Vietnam. And so here, the war certainly featured in his success. You know, his particular circumstance was that he had been educated in Hong Kong and he had learned English, he had gone to Vietnam uh, during the Second World War. He found himself in Vietnam, initially in a place in which the currency of English was not worth that much. Um, but that changed with the arrival of the Americans as part of the conflict in Vietnam. And so his financial fortunes rose along with the presence of the American military because the English language became quite a valuable commodity. So he was, on one hand, quite a successful business person, the proprietor of a very successful English school, um, and, uh, and he made a lot of money. You know? And in the Chinese culture, there's nothing shameful about making a lot of money. You know? In the West, we have a very tortured relationship with money. Um, we want to make money, but we want to be very discreet and um, and sort of voce about it uh, in some circles, not so in others. But in, in the Chinese culture, it's fine. You, know, you can go up and make as much money as you want, and that's, that's cause for celebration. Uh, so, so he made a lot of money, but he was also someone who lived large and did not deny himself any of his appetites. So he was uh, quite an incorrigible gambler, um, and the same could be said for his womanizing. Um, over uh, the course of his, uh, you know, his uh, career, shall we say, you know, as a, uh, as a lover, he had four wives, I don't know how many um, mistresses and, and so on and so forth. Uh, he made a lot of money and lost all of it, you know, he, he simply could not hold on to it. He loved to play mahjong. Uh, he formed you know, what he viewed as blood brotherships with a number of his co-mahjong players and then he lost fortunes to them. So he was someone who, who had these two sides to his life and on one hand was very responsible and very successful and on the other <coughs> hand was, was completely out of control. <coughs> and so that was told to me uh, and, and that all, all along was made possible in many ways by the conflict of Vietnam because it gave him the money. You know, it, was, it was an environment in which there was a tremendous amount of, of sort of social license to do certain things, and so he did them. And, uh, and so that story was told to me in many ways as a cautionary tale. You know, it was not told to me as a story that had anything to do with the war, really, but it was related to me that this is a cautionary tale. Like, here's this guy, he did so well, but then he, uh, he did all these terrible things which ruined his life, you know. or so they say. I don't know. You'd have to ask him whether he thought they ruined his life or not. So that's where this book comes from. You know, it's a book which is a world within a world within a world. You know, it's a book which is amongst a particular kind of Chinese people in this Chinese subculture, which once existed within Vietnam. So you can sort of imagine concentric circles. And I'm going to read to you from uh, the middle of the book, just a short passage to give you a flavor of the place and a flavor of the time. And 
at this point in the book, um, our, our titular character, uh, Percival Chen, well, I shouldn't say our titular character because it's not in the title, but um, our, our hero or anti-hero, Percival Chen, uh, finds himself having made huge financial commitments with gigantic debts that he can't possibly pay, uh, and uh, he's deciding what to do. He's just managed to borrow a whole bunch of money from some, some very unsavory people who are going to do bad things if he doesn't pay it back. And he's in his car, his driver is in the front of the car, and his driver is trying to get him home and keep him out of trouble. So, the car's headlights arced over the flashing light legs of the fragile street girls, their bright colored butterfly dresses, lipstick slashes on their tired grandmother mouths. Home, right boss, said Han Pai, the driver, as he guided the car through the fluid night. It's early, said Percival. He thought of the family quarters at his house, of the heat, the closed rooms. Well, he could gain some relief if he opened the doors, but he wondered what the night was like at Le Grand Monde. What about Le Paradis? Maybe people were in a good mood there. He rolled down the window and put his hand into the night air. He rubbed the cool humidity between his fingers. Was the joy of luck to be his tonight? All he needed was a few good rounds of macho. The big Peugeot floated through the streets. The Sanwa Hotel was just a few blocks away. Percival reflected on his luck. Hmm. In the glancing headlights, a girl's smile flashed, plucked out of darkness. Others walked nearby. <clears throat> Through his fluid cognac haze, he saw their light steps, their slender thighs quick in darkness. If nothing else, this war had brought miniskirts to Saigon. Percival said to Han Pai, take me to the Sanwa Hotel. Han Pai did not change direction. Headmaster, you said that you wished to go straight home. Well, I've changed my mind. No, I want to see if anyone I know is at the Sanwa Hotel. It's still early. Ah, boss, that's a dangerous place. There are no small money games there. You know that, just big money mahjong. Maybe you want to go somewhere else. You've been doing well with blackjack. Or let's find you a girl, some pretty company. Do you like that one? Han Pai slowed the car a little, and Percival considered the crossed ankles, the bare shoulder. And I will point out to you, you know, because um, as a physician, I work in harm reduction, right? So you can see that his driver, Han Pai, is taking a harm reduction approach. He's trying to lessen the damage that he can cause to himself by <coughs> encouraging him to play blackjack and hire a prostitute from the street, as opposed to whatever other trouble he knows that the guy might soon find himself. So, so it sort of shows you what, um, you know, what his driver knows about, uh, about how much trouble he can get into. Percival replied, no, no, I don't go with that kind of girl. Anyhow, I feel very lucky tonight. Look, boss, said Han Pai, look, you are already lucky. Look, you still have the car. It hasn't been taken by the loan sharks yet. And you have the money for tomorrow's interest payment, yes? Yes, I have the car, but look, this money, it's not mine. It's borrowed. Percival thumbed the thick layers of cash, thought about the interest rate. The envelope tingled in his hand, excited the fingers. Borrowed money, however, was a sing-song girl in a bar. It could be touched, but not possessed. The sweetest money was delivered by good fortune. Hmm. Winning the car back in that bet, that had given him a taste. No, I don't want a night like this to be wasted. Max said that you promised him not to gamble big money. Han Pai, an old employee, took much more liberty than most drivers. Tonight, there were no flares or bombardments, which often agitated the southwest sky. A lonely military helicopter beat the air as it passed above the car, a single eye of its spotlight appearing here and there. Then the sky fell silent again. 
Beneath it, Shalom was noisy and alive. Pungent food smells, oil and garlic, meat and ginger, drifted through the window. Percival was hungry for the night, to touch the girls who leaned in doorways with hands on thighs, to caress the smooth ivory tiles, and to sweep up piastres from a table. He said to his driver, you and I both know, our friend Mac is practical. He knows how to get things done in the way that someone arrives at a place by walking. One step at a time, much work, I respect that, but the gods of luck can change everything. In a moment, you are blessed with everything you want. It's like flying. Or you are ruined, headmaster, and your money is vanished. And worse, that money is not yours. Hmm. You have passed the road to the Sunwa Hotel. You must turn back, he said. It was not for his driver to say otherwise. As you wish, Hanjo. Han Bai pulled up outside the folding metal gates of the hotel. Percival got out, breathed the night air, thick and damp like a wet cloth. He knocked. Soon a maid peered through the gates, recognized Percival, scraped a key through the lock, and let him in. She knew that he could find his own way up and lay back down on her cot in the lobby. Upstairs, room 28, Yi Ba, in Cantonese. The, sum, the numbers that sounded like easy fortune. Three tables played, each in a corner. A hotel boy dozed on a cot in the fourth corner of the room, near the purser, who sat next to the money safe, drinking tea. Percival knew some of the players, and others were strangers to him. Mrs. Ling looked up. Percival Chen, now there's a lovely sight. As are you, he bowed. We have missed you. I was concerned that you had lost your taste for beauty, said Mrs. Ling. She gave a high, tinkling laugh as she swept a pile of chips towards herself. She wore her necklace of pale jade, the clasp of a carved dragon, over a well-tailored black silk dress. Pale jade was for a young lady, but she managed to wear this adornment <clears throat> elegantly. She clothed herself in a precise way that allowed her desirability, but placed her respectably beyond reach. She asked Percival, do you have any new teachers at that school of yours? Does any of them need a wife, perhaps a girlfriend? Ah, you would like to marry one of my teachers, Mrs. Lane, he asked. No, look, you know, all of my young friends have soft skin and tender hearts, she murmured. If your teachers want anything special, I can provide. Mrs. Lane dealt in specific appetites, just as other business people procured Levi's jeans and Rolex watches. The Australians and American ex-servicemen who taught alongside Percival's local teachers at the English Academy were very good customers of hers. Marriage or fun, either, she said, American dollars or military scrip, she turned again to the chips she had just won, counted attentively. These were good times for Mrs. Ling. In addition to the usual hotel work, there were foreigners who wanted to meet nice girls rather than bar dancers, families who paid to have their daughters married away to America. In the best of these transactions, Mrs. Ling made money from both sides. Police Chief May sat opposite, opposite the matchmaker. Cheng, a scrap metal dealer, sat at the same square mahjong table. Huang, an importer of Italian shirts, sat a little behind Chang and sipped a drink. There was a bald stranger in the game as well. He wore a banker's shade gripped tightly on his forehead, a green plastic halo. On a nearby couch, a Métis girl in a light blue dress was half reclined, her legs crossed. Her hands were slender creatures nested in her lap, and her elegance made the furniture cheap and shabby. She had strong French bones and warm Vietnamese skin. Her poise made it clear that she was better than the dress. The garment was slightly small for her, a cut which made Percival think of what was beneath, and yet was not so tight as to be vulgar. It was the way that Mrs. Ling typically dressed her girls. Percival had to remind himself not to stare. Mrs. Ling was a decent much on player, but when she went out to gamble, she often brought a girl with her, doubling her chances of making a profit. May said, 
Percival, so good to see you again. Maybe I'll have a chance to win back some of that money I lent you. And what about that money you have now? Are you sure you should be gambling with that? Oh, I assure you, I will leave with more than I've brought. Well, many people who have lent you money have always admired your house. Is there anyone in this town who does not know my business? Well, you don't even try to hide it. The police chief tipped his head towards the bald stranger. This is a new friend, Mr. Cho. Someone told him the Sunwell is the best place for a big money game. <coughs> Cho's eyes twinkled at Percival, his lips pressed in a grin. He joined Mei and Chang to wash the tiles, swirl them around in preparation for the next game. The smallest finger of Cho's left hand had a delicately curved fingernail that was as long as the digit itself, which he protected within his palm as he mixed the tiles. Mrs. Ling lit, lit a methylated cigarette. She always insisted that the men should wash the tiles, so she wouldn't ruin her perfect hands, she said. But Percival saw how she took this moment to assess her opponent's unmasked expressions, to see if they were nervous or confident in the way they moved. The players began to stack the ivory pieces into the four walls that would frame a new game. It's been too long since we've seen your brother, said Chang. I hope you bring me some luck. Percival felt the touch of the girl's eyes on him. When he summoned the courage to glance over, she had already turned away. This was good luck. A beautiful girl's presence invigorated a room, like the energy that came from a pile of valuable chips sitting on a table. How much would her introduction cost, he found himself wondering. The girl was aware of herself, carefully beautiful not one who stood on the street anxiously watching car windows. She might cost more than Mrs. Ling's usual 10,000, 15. Perhaps she would cost 20. No, he scolded himself. He could not afford 20,000 piastres for a girl right now. Not even this one. Sure. So the the question, and I'll repeat the question just because I'm not sure about the, the acoustics in the room. Um, the question is about the suitability of the book as a film and whether there have been any sort of approaches or movements in that direction. Um, I'll say that there's nothing there's nothing that's sort of signed and sealed right now. Uh, but you know, discussions come up and sort of happen all the time. Um, you know, the, the funny thing about the, the, the cinematic business is there's, there's lots of speculation and, uh, you know, and people, are, people are constantly sort of, uh, you know, trying to put things in place for one project or another, but a lot has to come into focus for that to happen. Um, I guess on the question of whether the book is suitable or not, I mean, you know, there's a different language, I think, which exists in in the screen than in books. Um, I, I always take it as a, as a very significant compliment when people say what you've said, when people say that, that it would be suitable for a film, because I think, you know, what, what, what I like to think, in any case, is that it has sort of ignited within the imagination um, for, for someone to say that. And, you know, ultimately, that's what we try to do, I think, as novelists. You know, we, we try to use these 26 letters to, to ignite a world and for that world to, to come alive in people's imaginations. 
Um, and, uh, and, and of course, you know, when one is really into a book, then it feels almost like there are many visual dimensions to it and, and many experiential dimensions to it. So I take that as a great compliment. It is. Um, thank you. Yeah. Also, um, the, um, the people that are caught in the wrong side during one period and then are caught in the other side of another period, um, how it's such a it's such a pain to watch people being caught by wars and politics. Um, and I felt a lot for the uh, the people that were casualties. Yes. In somebody's decisions. Right. Right. I think the, the comment is about people being caught on the wrong side and, um, and the sympathy that, that you feel for them. And I certainly, I certainly feel the same way. And um, you, you might be thinking about, about people who, who perhaps were caught in, in the north during the partition um, in 1954 and who ended up moving south, but then ended up, you know, again being, being caught in, in the wrong place. I'm not sure if that's specifically what you're thinking about. Well, the, the, the police and the, uh, and the people that were controlling certain aspects of, of the city and, and, of course, the partition. Um, but it, it's just like, do we always need someone to control things? Can't be people right. be free? Well, I, I think this is, um, uh, this is a very good and a very large question. You know, do we always need people to control things? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that... Uh, it's probably uh, beyond the purview of, of this book to answer that question in a final way. Um, but I, I do think, I mean, we have a human history of uh, people trying to exert power over each other. I mean, that's, that's part of the way it is. Um, one of the fascinating things for me about the conflict in <coughs> Vietnam is that, you know, to to, to an extent that, that made it very, very difficult for people to, to sort out whose side they were on and, and whose side someone else was on. You know, things were very, very much um, interwoven throughout Vietnam in terms of loyalties. You know, so it was not uncommon at all that within the same family, you know, the family would have people who were fighting on both sides of the conflict or people who would be ostensibly on one side, you know, for instance, who would ostensibly be you know, part of the, the southern apparatus, but in reality had loyalties towards the north and towards the communists. I mean, this was not, this was not uncommon. You know, this, this in fact, um, you know, was a very typical experience for people. Um, and, you know, I think part of, part of, the, the thing which many people from outside Vietnam perhaps didn't understand was that for, for many people on both sides, the key issues were never really communism and capitalism. They, they really had much more to do with nationalism and independence. And, and those were the desires that fueled many people more than you know, the, the desire to, to sort of implement a certain political and economic ideology. Um, you know, so that's something that we have, I think, and I say we because I grew up in a Western context, but we had a, a great difficulty kind of getting our heads around as outsiders. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm interested in hearing uh, your, your experience of writing fiction, because uh, for you yourself as a, as a writer and as a physician, when you write these, you know, like, uh, do, do, you, do you feel like, you have certain uh, things that you want to say as a physician, or that uh, you, uh, when you are writing, you, you forget that uh, the aspect of, of your life and, and becomes uh, something, uh, you know, do you, do, you, do you feel that when you are writing fiction, there's something else happening? What, what is that experience of uh, writing fiction for yourself? Sure. Um, what is the experience of writing fiction? Um, it's interesting. You know, I, I don't think about medicine at all when I'm writing. Meanwhile, 
it would be foolish for me to, to think that I would be exactly the same person if I were not also a physician. I mean, it has been a big part of my life uh, and a big part of my emotional and intellectual formation. So it's always there. Um, I do think that for me, a big part of the purpose of writing fiction is that I'm really, really drawn by this sense that there's something which I would like to express. And I think the best way I can describe it is that it's a certain set of emotions uh, and sentiments about a circumstance and about a time which cannot be expressed in any other way. You know, wherein there is no corresponding position statement or a thematic statement. Um, so, in a sense, you know, to the degree that disciplines like medicine, when they try to define themselves, you know, try to boil down the information to smaller and smaller formulations, you know, to general principles, um, to a concept, you know, to knowledge about a certain treatment, I feel that my intellectual direction when I'm writing is actually somewhat uh, going in a completely opposite direction, you know, because I'm trying to flesh out this sense of a certain set of emotions which I happen to think can only exist in the large format, can only exist in the length of a novel, you know, and, and which I, I don't even particularly try to encapsulate in that small phrase sort of way, you know. So, um, <coughs> you know, I don't know how well I'm, I'm explaining myself. I think another way of saying it is that you know, medicine sort of looks at the world, you know, and says, okay, let's, and much of science looks at the world, looks at the world and tries, however imperfectly, you know, to distill from it some essence, some principles, you know, something that becomes expressible on a smaller and smaller piece of paper, you know, whereas I'm actually starting with just this sense of something that I <coughs> have a great deal of difficulty putting into words, but which by necessity I feel needs to expand onto the breadth of several hundred pages. Um, that may sound very um, sort of self-indulgent, but, uh, but that's the way I feel about it. Do you have a question for the back? I was um, really interested in that book from a political, you know, when you talk about the description of something that is happens among people and the nuances, the political nuances of that situation at that time were uh, so well described that it was, I found it very uh, interesting and enlightening having uh, lived in the United States during the time of the Vietnam War and, and I was a young person watching all the people over, all the men over 18 left communities to go do this war and then our, our family moved back to Canada and uh, and then the, you know so you live during a time of, of these various things happening and what you can gather from the news is there's the American news I mean the US news and there's the Canadian news and there's the Manchester Guardian and there's CBC but there's nothing like a novel that takes you right into the heart of a situation and if it's well written like yours you have a, a great uh, uh, ability to depict a scenario in which a person like myself could read it and be there and, and appreciate those political nuances. And I really thank you for writing that book. And so my and a question though is, did you, were you raised in a politically aware environment where your family talked about these things all the time, think about this, think about that, but what about this side, what, look at the influences here, the, you know, did you analyze news broadcasts, or was it a personal uh, take that you that, that you approach life as a physician or a writer, or did you say, oh, that's an interesting thing, I'm going to flesh that out, I'm going to do some research on that, or how, what influenced you to to uh, be so aware of those new, the political nuances, I guess? Right. So, um, so I think that the question is, you know, where did my sense of politics come from? Did it come from a family background um, or from, from other sources within uh, the society within which I, I grew up? Is that, 
Is that fair? Okay. All right. Um, you know, I, I think, and, you know, the, the, the great caveat to generalizations is that they're, um, they're, they're hugely lazy and terribly untrue in many ways, but I'll make one anyways. Uh, and, you know, that is that I think in the case of much of the, uh, the Chinese diaspora, um, you know, and they're not, they're not unique. I think this could be said of other groups of people as well, but I will say that I think in the case of the Chinese diaspora, you know, I think there is a very, very strong... Um, uh, sense of wanting to live despite politics. You know, there, there isn't really um, a culture of wanting to engage head-on with politics. <clears throat> you know, I think that often the notion is, well, one needs to know about politics because this could be important. You know, this could affect laws. Laws could affect business. Um, they could affect all sorts of things in life. But, you know, what we would like to do essentially, you know, is to observe that landscape from afar and figure out how to navigate within it. Right? And I think that, you know, to to sort of be a little bit more specific, I, I think that that's probably that probably would have been the impulse of most, not all, but most Chinese people in Vietnam during this conflict. They viewed themselves as outsiders. Um, they did not view themselves necessarily as Vietnamese. They viewed themselves as Chinese people who happened to be living in Vietnam. Um, and there were a whole bunch of reasons that they were there. They were there for business reasons, for financial reasons. Then, of course, the Communist Revolution took place in China, making China a very tricky uh, place to go back to and in many people's eyes, undesirable. Though not for everyone. Some people did, did go back to China. Um, you know, so, so I would not say that, you know, that the environment that I grew up in was particularly political. It certainly was not sort of a politically aware environment in the way that we would think of in a Western liberal democracy, right? So, so I'm certainly interested in politics. I'm certainly aware of politics, um, you know, but I think that that probably, you know, comes for whatever variety of reasons people end up being interested in politics, you know. I'm not sure what it is, you know, people who, people who think too much, people who think the world could be a better place, you know, people who, who see visions and, and have, uh, you know, have grand dreams about society. You know, I don't know what causes these things to happen, but it happens in some of us, and, and I'm interested in politics, but, but I wouldn't necessarily say that that's a result of family upbringing. Yes. So as a writer, how easy do you find, uh, how easy is it for you to find and control the voices of all the characters in your writing? Oh, that's a good question. Um, how easy is it to find and control the voices? Well, I'm, you know, I'm sort of <coughs> relatively new at this. You know, I've written, uh, I've written a few books, but not nearly as many as, as some. And so I, I have a very, very hard time finding and controlling the voice. Um, in fact, with this book, I, I rewrote it several times. I wrote it initially in third person, and then I was unhappy with that. And then I decided that I would rewrite it in first person, and I was cautioned against doing that by my editors. But I did not listen to them, which is always a mistake, but it's sometimes necessary. You know, sometimes it's necessary for writers to make the mistake of not listening to their editors, right? So I did not listen. And so I spent a long time rewriting in first person, and that was a disaster. Uh, you know, it wasn't working at all. First person is a very, very tricky thing. You know, there the voice has to be incredibly dominant, and it creates lots of logistical problems. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also tried a sort of a side project at one point to write the book in four voices with you know, four main characters, each having a contemporary and a, a past voice. 
So it was a contemporary narrative for each of them, but with the interstitial passages which came from their childhoods. So eight voices. That was really, really a terrible, terrible uh, idea. You know, just completely unworkable structure. You know, I could not keep track of the voices at all. You know, so all of those things, you know, successively were thrown out, rewritten. You know, I ended up coming back to a limited third, right? Um, which is very versatile, and so I ended up coming back to that. So, you know, I so I would not say that it was easy to find voice because in the process of finding voice, you know, I'm sure I discarded at least a thousand pages. Um, you know, I, I spent. Uh, I spent a long time, I spent four years sort of wandering in the wilderness, being unhappy with the novel, being dissatisfied, you know, and, and just being generally melancholy about the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> you know, and I'm not, uh, I'm not complaining so much as I am explaining, you know, to say, you know, if you're out there writing a book and you're sort of feeling like you're in your third year of melancholy dissatisfaction with your book, well, you know, it may be that you're on the right track. So, so it's not it's not all bad because I do feel like I, I probably had to go through the process of exploring all those different ways of using voice in order to understand those characters sufficiently, in order to feel confident in the way I was using limited third. You know, limited third sounds a bit prosaic, and maybe it is, but but I didn't feel confident enough until I had gone and explored all kinds of things. So I find voice incredibly incredibly difficult. But um, the good news was that I had four bad years, and then I had one good year, where it all sort of came together. You know, the, the clouds parted, the sun shone, you know, and, and the book sort of descended upon the pages. That's an exaggeration as well. There was a lot of work um, in that year. But things worked at that point. And it was hard for me to see during the four years, but looking back, I really do think the four bad years were necessary for the one good year. Our next question comes from you. Um, thanks for your reading. I really enjoyed it. And I had a question about, from your introductory remarks, I take it that this book was very much inspired by the stories you heard about your grandfather, and he inspired the main character. And I was wondering whether, I guess from what you just said, it's always been a novel, but whether you had ever tried to write maybe a more nonfiction account of of his life and whether this novel is filling in his the life of a character like him in the way that you would have imagined it to be or whether the stories the oral history in your family is rich enough that a lot of these things actually happen so I'm I guess I'm yeah. asking how close it mirrors the life that he led sure that's a great question I mean the question yeah it's about the intersection between reality and mm -hmm. fiction uh, I mean, the, the principal character is very much inspired by my grandfather, um, but the, the events are all fictional in the end. And so, you know, although there's one exception, the one exception is there's a passage about his time in Hong Kong, uh, which is fictionalized, but many aspects of that are true. It's a very short passage, it's just a few pages. Um, so that's kind of the end result, you know, but I think your question. Uh, sort of, you know, also requires an answer in terms of how it ended up that way. And I will say that in the case of Bloodletting and Miraculous Cures, I felt very bound that everything must be fiction from an ethical point of view because I'm a physician and there's an issue of doctor patient confidentiality. <coughs> in this case, I did not feel bound at all. I felt I had free license to use fact and use fiction and intermingle them. And so when I initially started writing, I actually tried to use a fair bit of fact in terms of actual episodes. And I found it wasn't doable at all because I found that I would always be blocked by a knowledge that a certain thing had happened a certain way. And it was very, very hard for me to write it any different way. Mm -hmm. So I found that the only way that I could really work with a sense of freedom was in fact to, to invent um, entirely mm -hmm. fictional occurrences and and then to situate them within a milieu which I, I believed I knew well enough to do justice to uh, but to use entirely fictional occurrences and so from a writing point of view for me that was necessary 
uh, in order to have enough freedom. Now, maybe if it wasn't my grandfather, you know, and I knew about this guy, it wasn't my grandfather, maybe I would have felt more free with actually writing derivatives of fact. You know, but in this case, for whatever reason, um, I tried that and, uh, uh, and was not inhibited by any ethical reasons, but actually didn't work. Mm -hmm. And does your family recognize him in the, <coughs> assuming they read your book? Oh, sure. I mean, they would recognize him because everything, everything I told you in the introduction is true of both my grandfather and his character. You know, that he, he has this very successful English school, he makes a lot of money, he throws it all away, having a good time. Uh, and meanwhile, a war evolves around him and his, and his family and his life. That's all true. Um, but that's kind of just, you know, that's the... That's the starting point of the book, you know, and then, mm -hmm. and then the book begins, mm -hmm. right? Um, so sure, they would recognize him, but they would also immediately know that it's fiction because they know his life, and, uh, and they know that this didn't actually happen in his life. Thank you. I actually have a question. It's yeah. just to pick up on your observation that uh, film has its own language, it's its literature. And so I was, as I was listening to your reading, I was thinking, I was close my eyes as you told everyone uh, to do in the other lecture, um, trying to hear the language of your story, which is so important because um, it's about the successful entrepreneur of an English school. Um, so can you maybe talk a little bit about kind of the, the style that you were aiming for, the kind of inspiration for the particular language um, that you were drawing on in order to evoke this world that's, that's historically a little bit remote and experientially remote? Right, there. right. So the question is about language choice and, and how I, I chose a particular um, style in the book. And I think for me, I think, I think this, is, this is true really of all my work, you know, in in my ideal conception, you know, in my sort of perfect theoretical state of what a book should be, you know, I would love it if people actually forgot they were reading, you know, and uh, and the and if the experience were fluid enough that the um, you know that the words just were experienced as if they were just entering the consciousness, um, you know, but passing through and leaving whatever, whatever their meaning was. Now, that's a fictional construct, you know, of what I imagine fiction could be. That's not exactly how people experience it. People do experience the words, but, but I, I'm, I'm always trying to take things out. Um, and, and there are many approaches. There are many approaches to style. You know, and, and some people, some people, you can pick up their work, and you immediately know that it is a certain writer. Um, and in in some cases, you know, the it's because there's a very distinctive voice, and in some cases, it's because you know the language is very front of mind and very forefront in the work. Um, you know, and, and that's a different approach. You know, I wouldn't say it's any better or any worse, but that's a different approach. My approach is is very much you know, to leave everything out which can be left out. Um, and, you know, to, to, just, to, to just leave uh, something which is simple and spare. And, you know, it's very, it's very tempting when you're writing about historical stuff to put a lot in. You know, because you, you do all this research and it's a lot of work. So you go and you read and you read and you read and you know all this stuff, you know, about the place and the time and the politics and the physical environment. And so it's incredibly tempting just to put it in. And usually what I end up doing is I do put it in. Like I put tons of it in and then I take about 90% of it out because I realize it's actually not helpful to the story. You know, I feel that I have to, to get past my own issues by just putting it in. You know, and sometimes by putting it in, it becomes all the more obvious which, which parts have to come out. You know, so, um, so in terms of process, that's also very much of my approach, you know, to give myself freedom when I'm drafting. 
and to be very disciplined when I edit, and very self-critical when I edit, um, and to be that way with my language. I'm very indulgent when I'm drafting. I write run-on sentences and things that don't make sense and long, long rambling sort of you know train of thought passages, and it can be very unreadable. But I accept that because I know I'll be disciplined later and take stuff. Yes, question. Yeah. Uh, I'm a librarian, so I like to ask, uh, what type of books do you like to read, and what books, <coughs> books authors influenced you? What was the last part? What books? Uh, what books and authors influenced you? Oh, okay. Well, that's always um, that's always, you know, such a tricky question because. Now I can just start talking and talking and talking, and I wouldn't stop. Um, what do I read? I, I mean, I read, I read both fiction and nonfiction. Um, you know, I I don't read. I would say now I don't read any genre, but I did read uh, genre when you know when I was a teenager. Um, you know, I always answer differently because it depends what I've been reading recently. I'll tell you what I've been reading recently. So uh, this summer I read uh, Anna Karenina, which I'm embarrassed to say I had not read prior to this summer. Uh, so that's my admission, which I can make now that I've read it. <laughs> and, and it was great. Um, I read a lot of Chekhov this summer as well. Uh, I read some Cormac McCarthy, uh, which was good, you know. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, I don't think Cormac McCarthy will ever be sort of hugely influential for me, but that's an example of very strong, distinctive voice. Minimalist as well, you know, but minimalist to the point of that being a certain type of voice in itself. Uh, in the spring, I read a lot of Orhan Pamuk, um, who, who's quite a remarkable writer, Turkish writer, as you know. Uh, and then, of course, the, there's the Canadian canon, you know, that you, you cannot help but read if you're a Canadian. You know, so I read all of my friends. I'll just say that because, you know, <laughs> I might be held to account, and it's just best to say all contemporary Canadian writers. I read you all. <laughs> we all read each other. Um, but uh, you know, some huge influences have co have of course uh, been people like Ondaatje, Atwood, you know, Monroe. You know, it's interesting. I mean, some of the writers whom I admire the most are not writers whose style bears much uh, in common with my own. I mean, you know, I love Undace. I don't write like Undace at all, you know. Um, so, you know, this is, just, this is just the way it is. You know, I think sometimes we can, we can almost love writers whose style is different than our own more than we can love writers who are similar to our own style, you know, just because, and it's not through jealousy, but it's because I think for a lot of us who who write, um, you know, as part of what we do professionally, when you're reading something that has a lot of immediate relationship to what you do, then you begin to think professionally in some sense. You begin to think <coughs> structure and technique and how a writer is transitioning from, you know, from one passage to the next and, and how they're pulling off certain tricks with the reader. So you start to think about all that stuff. And if you're reading, you know, uh, if I read David Mitchell, for instance, um, you know, then I, I completely lose myself because I'm not, I don't write like that at all. So I can just let myself go as a reader, much more so um, than if I'm, I'm reading people whom I feel are closer to my own voice. We have time for one more question. 